For the last 15 months, I've been working on a story on former NFL quarterback Steve McNair. You may remember McNair for a variety of reasons. He first rose to prominence in the mid-90s as a star quarterback at a historically black college in Mississippi. Or you may remember him from his time with the Tennessee Titans. He nearly led the Titans to an upset win in Super Bowl 34 in one of the most dramatic games in NFL history. In some cases, when a writer profiles a star athlete, people close to the athlete are hesitant to talk, especially if the athlete is a private person. They don't want to betray the athlete's trust, say something they're not supposed to, and have something get out in the public. In the case of Steve McNair, it's been harder than usual to get people to talk. Part of that is due to the line of questioning. I've been digging into Steve McNair's private life. I've asked people about his sex life, about his relationship with his wife, and about his finances. I've interviewed his friends, his teammates, his pastor, his favorite professor, his cousin, two of the mothers of his children, and one of his four sons. I've tried getting as close to McNair as possible, but I found that several people close to him, the people closest to him perhaps, have stopped talking about him publicly altogether. That is probably due to the nature of his death. Nine years ago, on July 4th, 2009, Steve McNair was found dead in a condo in downtown Nashville. He was found sitting on his couch with his head laid back, two shots to the chest and one to each temple. His mistress, Sahel Kazemi, who went by the name Jenny, was dead at his feet with a single gunshot wound to the head. NFL quarterback Steve McNair was found shot to death in a news story out of Tennessee. Former NFL quarterback. One female, one male. McNair was known to visit the condominium area, but I didn't have any know. answers for you now as to what's happened, who's responsible. Well, police are investigating a crime scene. crime scene. My name is Tim Rowan, and welcome to Fall of a Titan, a serialized podcast that will re examine the death of Steve McNair. There are a lot of unusual things that have gone on that have never been brought to surface. Yeah, a lot of people don't like it's me. Such an open close case. His death is about money, power, and so on. This project started in the summer of 2017, when my editor approached me about doing a story on Steve McNair. It would fit into a series we have called SI True Crime where we write stories on the intersection of crime and sports. Weirdly enough, SI had never done anything significant on McNair's death. What's more, when I told people I was working on this story, many of them had forgotten that McNair was even dead. I found that odd. Here was a borderline Hall of Fame quarterback who was gunned down by his mistress. And people just forgot about that? Maybe it's because Steve was retired from football by then and out of the public eye. Or maybe it's because the police considered it an open and shut case. Just four days after the bodies were found, the Nashville police held a press conference and announced that Jenny had murdered Steve in a fit of jealous rage and then turned the gun on herself. After that, neither Steve's family nor Jenny's family said much of anything. The general public seemed to accept the police's explanation. The media moved on to other stories, and that was that. My editor thought it would all be straightforward. Pull the police report, get a hold of the family, walk the reader through what happened that night. Well, a colleague of mine had just done a story on Vince Young, McNair's protege. He had a number for a guy named Mike Moo, who had done some work for both Vince and Steve. Could be a good place to start. So one day, I called up Mike and told him what I was trying to do. That SI wanted to do this big project on the life and death of Steve McNair. Did he know how I might be able to reach the family? Mike sounded hesitant. He wanted to know why we were poking around this story. He was especially curious, have we uncovered anything new? Mike ended our call by saying something to the effect of, the family would prefer not to talk right now and hope that I would respect their privacy. Obviously, I couldn't just leave things like that. If the family wasn't going to talk, I wondered, 
Who would? I started doing some more research, and I came across an ESPN story that briefly mentioned a guy by the name of Vincent Hale. He was an ex-Nashville cop who had questions about the case. I emailed Vincent and gave him the same spiel I'd given Mike Moo. Vincent responded nine minutes later. I'll call you in a bit, he wrote me. Just learned some new information yesterday. It turned out Vincent had been investigating the Steve McNair case on his own pretty much from the start. Yeah, I was in Nashville at the time. You know, we're talking eight years ago now, back July 4, 2009. And for me, I can remember that day like it was yesterday. I was getting ready to get in the shower, and someone called me, and they said, hey, Steve got shot. And I'm like, Steve who, right? Like Steve Johnson, Steve Jackson? No, Steve McNair. I'm like, yeah, whatever. So I turn on the news, and sure enough, the initial report was that Steve McNair had been found inside a condominium in Nashville down on 2nd Avenue, and there was a female that was found with him as well that was also dead. And, you know, it it just blew my mind, right? It was one of those things like, how did this happen? What happened? Who did it? And why? Here's what the Nashville police said happened. They said that in the final weeks of her life, Jenny was spiraling out of control. She had suspicions that Steve was cheating on her, She was getting more and more stressed about her financial situation. And then, on July 2nd, she was arrested for a DUI, with Steve sitting in the passenger seat. The next day, on July 3rd, Jenny allegedly purchased a gun from an ex-con in the parking lot of a Dave & Buster's, the same Dave & Buster's where Jenny worked as a waitress. Then later that night, Jenny brought the gun to Steve McNair's condo and waited for him to come home. Steve had been out drinking with friends, and he arrived sometime around 1.30 a.m. The police said that, in all likelihood, Jenny waited until Steve was asleep on the couch and then shot him four times. They said McNair was killed sometime around 2 a.m. After Jenny killed McNair, the police said she positioned herself next to him on the couch and shot herself in the head so that she would fall into his lap when she expired. Her body ended up falling to the floor, And that's where she was when two of Steve's friends found the bodies several hours later in the early afternoon of July 4th, 2009. After nearly four days of intensive investigation that includes laboratory test results and other investigative methods, the police department has concluded that Steve McNair was murdered by Sahil Kazimi and that in turn Sahil Kazimi killed herself with a single gunshot wound to her head. While we may never know exactly what drove Ms. Kazimi to make that decision on that Saturday morning, the totality of the evidence clearly points to a murder-suicide. Vincent thought it all sounded a little too perfect, a little too Shakespearean. He didn't think that Jenny Kazimi, a petite Dave & Buster's waitress, was capable of such an elaborate killing. And, you know, three days later, according to Nashville police, the case was ruled a murder-suicide. It was solved basically in three days, which... I thought, personally, especially being a former Nashville police officer, that that was record time for a murder investigation. You know what I mean? So that's what really got me to start questioning the validity of the case. I just looked at the circumstances. Okay, you have this 20-year-old female who had just turned 20 who basically was living the life. She was dating a millionaire, an ex-football player. You know, she had Cadillac Escalade. She had gone across the country on all of these lavish trips. And then when Nashville police said Steve was shot once in each temple and twice in the chest, I said, there's no way that this little petite female would pull that off. Like I've been around guns for 20 plus years between the army and police, and I couldn't bring myself to even do something like that, right? And so Vincent took matters into his own hands. He spoke with a reporter at a local TV station and agreed to do an interview as an ex-cop who had questions about the case. Meanwhile, Vincent started reaching out to Jenny's sister, some of Jenny's friends, a few of Steve's family members. He was mining them for info and starting his own investigation. Eventually, Dateline NBC invited Vincent on to appear on a segment on McNair's murder. You know, they flew me up there, and you know, I told them why I didn't think this was murder-suicide, and went through the whole spiel, and So I watch Dateline, and I tell all my friends and family, hey, you got to watch Dateline. I'm going to be on. You know, it's going to be great. Talking about Steve's murder. 
and I'm watching it, and it's like they show Eddie George for like 40 minutes, and then they show this lady who was some sports psychiatrist that talks about athletes sleeping around on their wives. I'm like, well, where the heck am I at talking about the murder, right? So for the last two minutes of the show, they show me, and it says this former Nashville cop doesn't believe it was a murder-suicide, and he says he doesn't have a lot of love for his former chief, which I made no bones about it. I didn't, right? So I'm like, that's it? That's all you guys? That's it? So then I get on the post after the show, you know, where people can go on and comment. And people are like, forget what Eddie George says. We want to hear what this ex-cop had to say. Like, he worked in Nashville. Why does he not think it's a murder-suicide? I was like, huh. Well, if you want to tell a story, tell it yourself, right? So Vincent started writing a book about all of his research and theories. He called it Playbook to a Murder. The final product is 133 pages, but it reads quicker than that. The margins are ridiculously wide. The writing is also a bit sloppy. On the page, at least, Vincent does come off a little bit like a rambling conspiracy theorist. Listen to this passage Vincent wrote. Quote, All who spoke of Sahel Kazemi stated she barely would raise her voice let alone physically hurt anyone. So how did this seemingly peaceful 20-year-old go from joyful and easygoing to assassin before turning the gun on herself? Or was Sahel Kazemi the sacrificial lamb to serve as the fall guy to a titanic cover-up? A little cheesy, right? But if you get past all that, Vincent does make a number of good points. He talks about how the murder weapon was a cheap gun that often got stuck, He talks about how it was unlikely that Jenny, a complete novice, could have been that accurate. He has questions about the police narrative regarding Jenny's motive. He has questions about the two guys who found the bodies, two of Steve's friends, and why it took them so long to call the police. He has questions about items possibly missing from the condo. And he has questions about the ex-con who allegedly sold Jenny the murder weapon. In short, he thinks the police royally botched the case. Vincent started printing the books, and selling them basically out of his house by word of mouth. I had it on a zip drive, so I would take the FedEx Kinkos, and the closest one was 15, 20 miles from my place. (laughs) I would take the FedEx Kinkos, print out the copies. I would get the paper cutter because I knew what size it needed to be cut, cut it perfectly, and then I would literally go home and bind them. So I had this binding machine in my home office. I'd bind it one at a time let it dry, do the next one, let it dry. So I went so far in the hole with that book, trust me. Eventually, he started selling them on Amazon for $19.99. At one point, Vincent tried reaching out to a few publishing companies to try and expand the book's profile. According to Vincent, one of them responded and said it was willing to buy the book for somewhere around $200,000, as long as he made some edits. I sent it to like four or five, right? And this one in Wisconsin responded we started corresponding on the phone and i'll never forget she says well we're willing to buy the rights to the book sign you to this deal and it was in the hundreds of thousands but first we want you to incorporate tiger woods and someone else i can't remember some other athlete that had gotten caught having an affair and i'm like well what's that got to do with anything right she said well it'll just add sex appeal to the book I'm like, well, the book's not about sex appeal. The book's about the murder of Steve McNair and Sahel Kazemi and what didn't happen versus what did happen. Oh, well, we know what sales, and we can have this out before the Super Bowl, and you'll make yada, yada, yada per unit. I'm like, "Mm, no, (laughs) no. So, yeah, I turned it down, and I, to this day, I can honestly say I do not regret that decision, right? Because to me, integrity is everything. Instead, Vincent turned around and tried using that integrity as a way to get close to Lucille McNair, Steve's mother. In March 2010, Vincent sent her a copy of his book and a handwritten letter. He shared a copy of the letter with me. In the letter, Vincent told Lucille about the publisher's offer. He wrote, quote, I strongly told them that is not the reason behind the book, and I would not disrespect Steve or his family. I told them take it or leave it, so I guess they left it. Besides, The intent behind the book was not to become rich, it was about doing what's right. Vincent seemed to be trying to convince her that his intentions were pure. He did make a point of noting, quote, I am by no means suggesting I am 100% correct, 
However, there were too many flaws with the investigation and too many lies by countless people for the case to have closed in four days! Exclamation point. Well, his letter worked. A few months later, Lucille invited Vincent to come visit the ranch, the big house that Steve built for his mother on a plot of land near Mount Olive, Mississippi, near where Steve grew up. Yeah, we were sitting right on the porch, and she had these two wooden rocking chairs out there. I was on the left, she was on my right, and uh, she said, Vince, I don't believe that little girl killed my son. She said, you know, I'm X amount of pounds, and she said, I couldn't shoot a 9 millimeter with that much accuracy. And, you know, I told her then, and I said, listen, I said, basically, as long as I have breath in my body, I'm going to fight to find out what happened to Steve. They stayed in touch, and eventually... In March 2012, Vincent and Lucille made a pact. Lucille officially hired Vincent to investigate the case on her behalf. I got my Tennessee private investigator license, which is inactive now, of course, because I don't live in Tennessee. And I charged Lucille one dollar, and I said, this is the retainer, and I'll never charge you another dime. And I really just did that for legality purposes. Like, you're a private eye, you have to have a retainer to say you have a client. So she gave me four quarters. And true story, and I'm sure I could find a receipt somewhere or something, I took those four quarters to SunTrust, and I deposited four quarters. And I remember the teller looking at me like, what the? It's like, I have to deposit this, you know, because it went into my business checking account. So charged with seal one dollar, haven't charged her a dime since, nor will I ever. As Vincent continued investigating the McNair case, he also appeared on several TV shows discussing it. True Crime with Aphrodite Jones, Crime Watch Daily, Mysteries and Scandals on the Oxygen Channel. After the Aphrodite Jones show, Vincent felt that people started taking a renewed interest in the case. Shortly after that, my email started blowing up. You know, people interested in the case, or, hey, I never thought this, or, you know, I even got emails that said, hey, you should write a second book, you know, because we know there's more. We know you held back on the first one. And so Vincent wrote a second book. He called this one Incomplete Pass. He started selling it on Amazon in 2014 for $10 a pop. The books, the interviews, the crime shows. Vincent Hill went all in on the Steve McNair case, all while feeding our insatiable appetite for true crime entertainment. He raised some good questions, but the case never got solved as far as he was concerned, and so the cycle continued, and the true crime shows kept calling. The question I can't shake is, why is he doing this? Why won't he let this case go? A few people I spoke to wondered whether Vincent was in this for money or notoriety, if this was all some way to profit off Steve McNair's death. Vincent's actions haven't exactly quieted those concerns. After appearing on Dateline and doing all these interviews, he's turned himself into a talking head. He'll come on your TV show now and comment on the topic of the day as a law enforcement expert. He usually gets invited on whenever another police brutality case pops up. Fox News is the most prominent network he's appeared on. During one of our earlier conversations, Vincent told me that his dream was to move to New York and land a full-time job at a major network. He had even hired his own agent. Vincent swears, though, he's working the Steve McNair case to find closure for Lucille McNair. When people question his motives, Vincent points out how he turned down all that money from that book publisher. I asked Vincent for more information about the publisher and the $200,000 offer. But he told me that he forgot which publisher it was and that he couldn't find their email correspondence. As for all those true crime TV shows, Vincent says he does those shows to bring more attention to the case in the hopes of eventually solving it. In these crime shows, I think they look for a sensational piece to it rather than telling the story for what it is, right? So, you know, eventually I would love to put my own documentary together and just scratch all the oh, we need reenactments, we need actors to pretend they're Steve and the pretenders to hell. Let's just sit down and start from scratch. And let's play the soundbite of Chief Surpass saying, it was a happenstance gun sale that happened inside the parking lot of Dave and Buster's. And then let's crack that. Now might be a good time to dive into Vincent Hill's background a little bit. Who exactly is this guy? Well, Vincent Hill grew up in a military family. His father served in the army and their family moved around a lot when Vincent was growing up. Young Vincent always had a fascination with uniforms, because that's what he'd seen his whole life. And so, when it came time to choose a career, Vincent joined the Army too. 
he was only 21 years old. All these years later, Vincent still looks like a military guy. He's a six foot one African American man with a broad chest, square jaw, and a shaved head. Vincent served in the Army for about eight years, from 1994 to 2002. He was based mostly in the States, and he worked mostly as a unit supply specialist and then as a supply sergeant. His job was to oversee the weapons room and make sure that the office supplies were stocked, make sure everyone had bedding, that kind of thing. But Vincent had dreams beyond the supply room. He'd listen to the counterintelligence guys talk, and he'd imagine doing what they did. I'd always wanted to do, you know, something with intelligence, which is, I guess, a nice word to say spy, I guess. You know, there's so many aspects of it. Like, you may actually just go get intelligence on a building. You know what I mean? Or you may use what we call Hemet's human intelligence to go get information on the enemy. Like prime example, if you ever watched the movie Black Hawk Down and you know the guy that was driving the cab around to let the U.S. forces know that that's where the bad guy was, you know, making that human contact to get what in police terms you call a CI, a confidential informant. And, you know, I think maybe that's why I, I thrive so well in narcotics because, you know, it's easy to get somebody to do something for you if you know how to entice them just right. By the summer of 2001, Vincent says he started the process to reclassify as counterintelligence. He says that he was accepted and he was given a start date. But then 9-11 happened and Vincent started having second thoughts. He says he hadn't signed his paperwork at that point. He could still back out if he wanted. He says that the army told him he'd be based in Germany if he stayed, but he wasn't so sure. And I knew where my future was headed, you know, being counterintelligence and right after September 11th, I just knew that my family would be in Randstein, Germany. I'd be in a desert somewhere looking for Osama bin Laden. At the time, it just so happened that Vincent's father-in-law was working for the Nashville Police Department. Vincent applied for a job, got accepted, and he ended up working for the Nashville PD for about four years from 2002 to 2006. While Steve McNair was playing for the Titans, Vincent Hill was running around town fighting crime. Vincent says he worked on patrol, in narcotics, and on something called the Flex Unit, which targeted high crime areas. I obtained a copy of Vincent's police file, and it showed that he received pretty good review scores and was named Officer of the Month multiple times. Vincent was also lauded several times for his detective work. There was the time when he recovered four stolen vehicles in five days, and the time when he worked undercover in a prostitution sting that led to several arrests. Then there was a story when, late one night, Vincent stopped a man on the street because he looked like a domestic violence suspect the police were looking for. Vincent asked for the man's ID and social security number, and when both of them appeared fishy, Vincent brought the man into custody. It turned out that the man was wanted in Atlanta on homicide and cocaine charges. The Nashville PD presented Vincent an award and sent out a press release commending his work on the case. Ron Surpass, the Nashville chief of police, said, quote, Officer Hill did a tremendous job following his instincts. This is just great police work. If there was a crime, I was going to find it. And if you ran, I was going to chase. Like It's like a dog. He sees a cat, it's going after the cat. I mean, the, I was that guy. Man, tracking down people is like the only thing I've been doing for the last 15 you know, years is investigating stuff, and, uh, you know, I, I love it. It's like I couldn't see myself doing anything else, to be honest with you. Just I couldn't. I, I wouldn't have the same passion for something else as what I do on a daily basis. But when Vincent started speaking up about the Steve McNair case, the Nashville police turned on him. They tried to discredit him as a detective. They pointed out that Vincent had never worked in homicide. During one press conference, a Nashville police detective called Vincent's work on the McNair case nothing but innuendo, speculation, and gossip. The Nashville police also pointed to an ugly incident that marred the end of Vincent's police tenure. As I looked through his police file, another embarrassing story turned up, actually. It was September 2005. Vincent and a few of his colleagues had just arrested a home invasion suspect. Vincent put the suspect in the back of his car and then stepped away for a few moments to speak to another officer. He asked a third officer to keep an eye on the suspect for him, but the third officer was preoccupied filling out his own paperwork. When no one was looking, the suspect slipped his handcuffs to the front, opened the car door, and came around to the front seat. 
Vincent watched helplessly as the suspect drove off in his own car. The Nashville police later apprehended the suspect, but Vincent received a five-day suspension for negligence. The more egregious incident, the incident the Nashville police still point to, came in June 2006. Vincent was pursuing a suspect in his car when his superior ordered him to terminate his pursuit. Vincent told his superior that he was terminating the pursuit, but instead, he continued to follow the suspect into another county, only with his police lights turned off. Then later, Vincent was accused of lying to his superior about disobeying orders. The department was preparing to suspend Vincent for at least 18 days, maybe more, when he decided to leave the department in September 2006, with the case still pending. Vincent told me that he left the department due to personal reasons. He was in the middle of splitting up with his second wife, and his daughter from his first marriage had come to live with him. Being a single dad who's a police officer who works 3 to 11, and you have a 10-year-old at the time staying at home by herself till like midnight, it doesn't become something you want to do too often. So it was time to just become dad, and it was just time to close that chapter of my life. During his exit interview, Vincent told the Nashville PD that he was taking a job at the Dollar General. Vincent told me that he applied for a job at the Dollar General, but he said he never ended up working there. He couldn't remember why. About six months later, Vincent sent a letter to the Nashville Police Department asking for his old job back. But Ron Surpass, the police chief, turned him down. And so, Vincent moved on. He told me that he worked for his family's trucking company for some time and then became a fraud analyst for a data company. That's what Vincent was doing when Steve McNair and Jenny Kazemi turned up dead on July 4th, 2009. I don't know if Vincent started investigating this case to get on TV or to make money. Maybe that's part of it, maybe not. But I do think he saw Steve McNair's death as an opportunity. An opportunity to flex his investigative muscles again. Get back to his glory days when he's chasing down bad guys. That's much more exciting than working an office job or working at the Dollar General. Vincent told me he's been investigating the McNair case pretty much continuously since 2009. Yeah, since uh, I guess you could say probably since July 8th when they had the press conference and they said it was a murder-suicide. I was like, nope, no way. So since July 8th, 2009, like there's probably, this is the honest to God's truth, not at least two days that go by where I don't go back and you can see this big red folder with hundreds of pages in it that I don't go back and say, what am I missing? Remember when I first reached out to Vincent in the summer of 2017? He said he just received some new information. He told me that a buddy of his from the police department had called him with a tip. He was following up on a rumor that Vincent had heard a while back. So the rumor was that uh, the very first EMT, and I'd really be curious to talk to that person and the first officer on the scene, said that when they went in, Steve was castrated and his penis was in his mouth. And, you know, I looked at the autopsy. There was no mention of that, right? So you kind of take it with a grain of salt. But I get a call from a friend who was on the department when I was. He had been on the department for 20 years. Out of the blue, uh, he called me. He leaves me a message. Hey, I know you're still working on this McNair thing. Give me a call. What the heck? So I call him. He's like, so what were Steve's injuries? I'm like, yeah, you know, once you need to jimple twice in the chest. Was he missing any body parts? I said, well, I heard a rumor years ago that he said he was castrated and his penis was in his mouth. I said, yeah, that's it. He's like, yeah. He's like, I got it on good authority that that's true. I mean, Jesus Christ, castrated? I know this is only a rumor, a rumor being relayed from a secondhand source. I don't know the validity of this claim, but I will eventually interview the forensic pathologist who performed the autopsy and try to get some answers. Mike Moo made it clear, Steve McNear's immediate family doesn't want to talk to me. All I have right now is Vincent. I don't know whether I can trust him. I don't know what his motives are. But he spent nine years now investigating this case. He can at least tell me where to start looking. You'll come to see that what I'm doing is not exactly an investigation, but rather a re-examination of the Steve McNair case. We're going to lay out the evidence, review all the characters involved, and go through the case step by step. And we're going to examine it all through the eyes of Vincent Hill the private eye who just won't let this case die. I think there was a lot of hate. Whoever did this, 
there was a lot of hate for Steve, right? You shoot someone four times, especially after you're dead, there's a lot of hate there, right? And if the story is true that Steve was castrated, you don't do that unless there's a lot of hate, personal hate there. So it could be a hundred reasons why that happened. And again, it could lead back to 10 other suspects other than Jenny Kazemi. Still to come on Fall of a Titan. I don't know if you've ever been to Alcorn State, but Steve was everything. Did everything, led the team, scored the most, ran the most. It it was a one-man show. He literally carried that university on his back. I mean, he was literally everything. And everybody went there just to see Steve. We left out of the stadium, and me, him, and a couple guys, we got into a limo, and we went to this club where they had the VIP section. And I can tell you, it was over 200 women in line there just to shake his hand, hugging him, kissing him on the forehead. It was just looking at each other like, what in the world is this? You know, I actually have had dreams and have asked him what happened. And every time he starts to tell me, I wake up from the dream. <laughs> 